Welcome back to Bus Boys and Poets Books Presents. Thank you for your patience. We were figuring out some last minute technical things, but I am so, so excited to present you tonight uh, to celebrate the 10th year anniversary of an Indigenous People's History of the United States. Here at Bus Boys and Poets Books, we center marginalized voices, we center history of the oppressed, of the marginalized, and uplifting those voices, and we are very, very excited. I know I said it twice, but that's how excited we are to be able to host uh, Dr. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz and Professor Ma May Lee Blackwell. And now before we get started, I'm going to do a quick little introduction. May Lee Blackwell is a professor. Uh, her book, Scales of Resistance, Indigenous Women's Transborder Organizing, published by Duke actually this year, very exciting, draws on 25 years of research accompanying Indigenous women's organizing in Mexico and its diaspora with over 70 oral histories. She is the author of the landmark Chicana Power, Contested Histories of the Feminism and the Chicano Movement, as well as co-editor of Chicana Movidas, New Narratives of Activism and Feminism in the Movement Era. She's the co-editor of the Critical Latinx Indigeneity Special Issue of Latino Studies and the professor of Chicano, Chicana, and Central American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. In addition to co-creating and directing the digital story platform Mapping Indigenous Los Angeles, May Lee is currently working on rematriating historical memory and seeding indigenous social movements through the Mobile Indigenous Community Archive, MICA, or MICA. Joining her tonight is the star of the hour, the author of our book tonight. We have Dr. Dunbar Ortiz, a New York Times bestselling author who grew up in rural Oklahoma in a tenant farming family. She's been active in the international indigenous movement for more than four decades and is known for her lifelong commitment to national and international social justice issues. Dunbar Ortiz is the winner of the 2017 Lennon Cultural Freedom Prize and is the author or editor of many books, including Indigenous People's History of the United States, a recipient of the 2015 American Book Award. She lives in San Francisco, and you can follow her on Twitter at, un, at R-D-U-N-B-A-R-O, because I'm not even going to play trying to say that and having you guys understand me phonetically. And with that, I'm going to bring on our guests. Hello. Well, Roxanne, happy Indigenous Peoples Resistance Day, 531 years of Indigenous resistance. Yes, October 12th. Yep. A notable so day. Yeah, here we are, uh, <laughs> thriving and surviving. I'm so excited to be here in conversation with the 10th anniversary um, of Indigenous Peoples History of the United States. And I feel like you're just on a roll with the recent publication of Not a Nation of Immigrants. And and um, maybe do you wanna start with a little bit about how this um, 10th anniversary edition is different from the original? So people might wanna buy the book if they don't have it. Yes, and um, the new edition, the 10th um, anniversary edition has some new material in it. Uh, the text is the same, but there's a new um, preface by Raoul Peck, who made a four-part series based on the book called uh, Exterminate All the Brutes, and a um, new introduction by me. So that new material is in the front, and some updates on uh, books and that have come out by Native scholars since 2014, a lot of them. Yeah. So I listed those as, uh, you know, so people can easily find those books. So um, I, I, I was surprised when Beacon Press decided to do a 10th anniversary edition. The book's been a bestseller on the New York Times list. Uh, it has sold out uh, multiple printings. I, I don't even know how many. So it was selling very well, and I couldn't uh, figure out why they wanted to put out a new edition with a beautiful new cover, hardback. Um, but I'm really happy about it. It's quite beautiful. And I think it will uh, introduce it to um, a new audience, you know, because 
was a whole new generation <laughs> since uh, since it was published. So it's uh, I hope I hope it gets to um, especially young people, young Native people reaching new audiences. And I think it's important just changing the narrative of how the U.S. tells its own history and its own story. Um, for me, of course, yeah, it's been really important. Um, even this day, uh, so-called Columbus Day, um, it's been rebranded as Indigenous People's Resistance Day. I was active as a young person in the 1992 fight against the quincentenary celebration, but I know your, um, your activism goes back, you know, from when the American Indian Movement was starting to fight at the United Nations. And what's the importance of, of you know, contesting Columbus Day, mm -hmm. not letting this mythology stand? Yeah, it was, um, you know, after the siege of Wounded Knee in 1973, uh, the American Indian Movement set up uh, the International Indian Treaty Council. And um, I was invited to um, help uh, organize a conference in Geneva, Switzerland at the United Nations headquarters there where they do anti-colonial um, business, uh, where they have human rights, everything about human rights. So it's a, an important conference and are more important than the General Assembly uh, for that matter. So uh, I agreed to do that. I was, you know, professor in a university. And so it was unpaid work, um, set up an office in San Francisco. There was an office in New York and um, a couple of other people. And I, you know, worked on, we, we, uh, uh, started a, a newsletter called the Treaty Council News, and we began raising money for to take uh, especially elders to uh, this conference in Geneva. And it happened in 1977. It was quite an amazing event. Um, it uh, uh, was quite surprising to the UN to see a hundred native people in their traditional uh, clothes marching into the UN. It was just a stunning um, uh, for them, you know, it was uh, uh, quite amazing and it really was beautiful. It was unprecedented. And the conference was a great success. Um, it called on a the development of a a working group on indigenous peoples, which we got in 1982. So me being a, you know, a professor with summers off and pretty easy to take off a week or two and of course, um, off in, in January, a full month. And I took lots of leaves of absence. I'm noticing that now with my um, uh, with my retirement, <laughs> I took an awful lot of uh, abs uh, leaves of absence without pay and did this work. I was one of the few people uh, free enough to uh, just uh, do it. Um, so I got quite involved in uh, the UN system. And it was um, the first thing we had, the, uh, the working group, um, it just happened to coincide, it was 1982, with the genocide in Guatemala and Rigoberta Menchu's whole family was killed and she was snuck out to um, Mexico and was in exile and she came and testified. So it got off to this really profound beginning, which we hadn't planned. Um, most of these meetings are rather boring, but this was, you know, just a stunning, um, which made people understand how precarious the lives of Native people are, you know, in, in the Western Hemisphere and other Indigenous peoples that we learn more about as we develop. So I retired from that work um, 
basically in 1995, but I kept going back for this or that, you know, just to visit. But the actual, you know, just lots and lots of work unpaid. I we, uh, Part of it was training other people, younger people to do it, young Native people and indigenous people from other countries. So it's a really one of the biggest, uh, once a year, there's a permanent forum on indigenous peoples in New York, two weeks. And it's the largest single um, meeting, bigger than the General Assembly, uh, bigger than the Human Rights Council and the whole UN system. So it's, it's, it's quite a journey. It's really an amazing process. And then in 2007, we got the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And now there's uh, work going on to develop a treaty on the rights of Indigenous peoples. All right. I think that's so important because I, I think maybe people in the United States in general are noticing the change from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Certainly we had a big fight here in LA County and thanks to that federal workers get Indigenous Peoples Day off on last Monday. Um, but this struggle goes way, way back and you've been in the fight for decades. So I think it's important to point out that you're uh, you know, a movement participant as well as a movement historian. I wonder, you know, changing this narrative of Columbus is so important. I wonder if you wanna share something from the book about shifting that narrative. Yeah, um, did, uh, I was going to read a, a little passage. You want me to do that sure. now? Sure, yeah. Uh, it's basically, uh, you know, this is, this is Columbus Day. <laughs> so um, this is the traditional day to celebrate the Mariner Columbus, which of course has been, um, uh, well, not the happiness of a lot of people, including the Italian population of San Francisco, where I live. They had their big uh, celebration on, on Monday. Um, but it, 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 it is a, um, definitely a change in how people see Columbus. So here's a little section uh, from, the, from the book, the original text. Searching for gold, Columbus reached many of the islands of the Caribbean and mapped them in 1492. The Roman Catholic Church's Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494 then divided the New World, so-called, between Spain and Portugal, with a line drawn from uh, Greenland south through what is now Brazil. That's how Brazil became Portuguese-speaking and um, the rest of South America uh, Spanish-speaking. Uh, called the Doctrine of Discovery, it claimed that the possession of the entire world west of that line would be open to Spanish conquest and all east of it to Portuguese conquest. With all of the indigenous peoples uh, already living for tens of thousands of years uh, to be enslaved and dispossessed. Uh, they had just uh, spent four centuries doing that to the Moors, the mortals, the Muslims in Spain, ethnically cleansing them. Uh, in fact, the ships went out uh, deporting all of the uh, Jewish and Muslim people uh, in 1492, the ship went out at the same time that Columbus ship was going uh, to uh, the West. So the story is well known. In 1492, Columbus sailed with three ships on his voyage at the behest of Ferdinand, King of Aragon and Isabel, Isabella, Queen of Castile, the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella in 1469 led to the merger of their kingdoms into what would become the core of the Spanish state. 
Columbus planted and returned to Spain with indigenous slaves and gold. In 1493, Columbus returned to the Caribbean with 17 ships, more than a thousand men and supplies. He found that the men he had left on the first trip had subsequently been killed by the indigenous inhabitants. After planting another settlement, uh, Columbus returned to Spain with 400 Arawak slaves. This was, you know, the indigenous people of the Caribbean. With seven ships, Columbus returned to the Caribbean in 1498, reaching what is now Venezuela, and he made a fourth and final voyage in 1502, this, this time touching the Caribbean coast of Central America at um, uh, the Cape uh, that's right in the corner of Nicaragua and Honduras on the uh, East Coast. In 1513, Vasco Nunez de Balboa crossed the Isthmus of Panama and charted the Pacific coast of the Americas. Then Juan Ponce de Leon claimed the Florida Peninsula for Spain in 1513. In 1521, following a three-year bloodbath and overthrow of the Aztec state, Fernando Cortes proclaimed Mexico as a new Spain. Parallel with the crushing of Mexican resistance were Ferdinand Magellan's exploration and charting of the Atlantic coast of South America, followed by Spanish wars against the Inca nation of the Andes. In both Mexico and Peru, the conquistadors uh, confiscated elaborate artwork and statuary made of gold and silver to be melted down for, the, for use as money. During the same period, the Portuguese laid waste to what is now uh, Brazil and began a thriving slave trade that would funnel millions of enslaved Africans to South America and the Caribbean, beginning the lucrative and deadly Atlantic slave trade. The consequences of this amaze, uh, amassing of fortunes were first felt in the catastrophe experienced by small farmers in Europe and England. The peasants became impoverished, dependent workers crowded into cities. So this was um, the onset of capitalism, basically, uh, was the um, the result of this uh, enormous amount of wealth uh, from uh, the uh, uh, from the the looting of the americas this is such a powerful narrative um and the whole book is so rich and you know so much historical and archival documentation but presented in a very powerful prose makes me think you know um who would we be if this is the story we read about Columbus as school children and understanding the interconnection uh, between enslavement and colonization and the birth of capitalism? What do you think are the, the stakes in telling this different narrative about Columbus and indigenous peoples of the Americas and the US for you? Well, it's been, um... It's been really interesting. It was so controversial at first. Um, it's it's almost hard to remember, uh, let's say, thirty years ago um, when we got the de when we got the declaration at um, in the United Nations. Not many people in the United States, other than Native people, uh, and even a lot of Native people thought this was, oh, you know, Native leaders and all that they had so many problems at home. Why put this, this 
invest in this UN. You know, there's this, this idea that the UN is useless, but it's only useless if you don't use it. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a powerful institution. And um, they, in the rest of the world, especially in, in the, um, um, in the third world, this is the most important institution. Um, it's not just the Security Council, it's all kinds of, of meetings year round, of course, the General Assembly and all the commissions. And what they're doing is manufacturing international law. This is how, you know, this is the origin of, of uh, modern international law. And that's an important tool. It's easy to think of, you know, well, the U.S. is so powerful and it just uses the military and it ignores, um, it ignores international law. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep using it uh, because the, you know, this is, these are war crimes that are being committed. And um, um, we have to get um, a solid block of people to understand that this is law that can be used um, domestically as well. And uh, because it's international law doesn't mean it's not law, you know, in the United States. So um, this is something, for instance, that you see Berkeley School of Law um, the, uh, has pursued and people are working on and many, many cases are now um, including international law. So it is terribly important, and especially for indigenous peoples who have, you know, still a colonial situation of being um, uh, all of their lands owned in trust. They don't own their the lands they live on. Uh, it's owned by the federal government, and it's put in trust, a trusteeship for native people, but that can be taken away with a stroke of a pen. So that's a very, you know, a very um, uh, fragile um, power. So it has to be changed, you know, so that that, that is uh, property of the um, indigenous people, not just uh, a, the, on the a grace of the United States. So there's still a colonization that has to be dealt with in the United States. So I think the the Treaty Council and, and there are now many other um, of these uh, indigenous organizations, non-governmental organizations that do this work, that it's terribly important. I, th I think one of the things that you're mentioning here and that the book really helps people understand is that indigenous people Native people aren't just another race or ethnicity in the melting pot of U.S. history. Um, and that is precisely because of what you're talking about, because of treaty rights. Um, but that's largely unknown, even to yeah. folks who are educated. Yeah. Yeah, in the um, early part of the book, the introduction to um, Indigenous people's history, I go through that of um, that <clears throat> that native people um, are you know there's really no such thing as native people indigenous people there are nations of people they're not you know they're not a race they're not an ethnic group uh, they're different nations and there are over three hundred of these nations in what is now the United States alone. Um, the largest uh, in the United States being uh, the Navajo Diné uh, Nation in um, the Four Corners area of Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. And um, <clears throat> others have had land uh, taken away illegally it was all taken illegally, but under agreements made between Native nations and the United States, even when those were settled, like the Great Sioux Nation, the Treaty of 1868, 
it whittled down a lot of the original um, territory of the Great Sioux Nation, but it certainly was a it was most of um, most of North and South Dakota, part of Nebraska, a part of um, uh, of uh, Montana, and um, that was then whittled down illegally, taken by force. So the restoration of the Great Sioux Nation is one of the most important things. It was what was behind the founding of the American Indian Movement, the Wounded Knee um, Uprising, and also the international work um, was that this was, and I think it clarified for others, yes, is the Navajo Nation, there's the Lakota Nation, Dakota Nation, there's the, the Ojibwe, um, Anishinaabe, uh, the Haudenosaunee, the, you know, the, the Pueblo uh, city-states uh, also have an all-Pueblo council. So the Apaches, and, and in California, of course, um, many very reduced nations because of the horrible um, genocide of the California Indians by first of all, from San Francisco to San Diego by Spanish colonization. But then secondly, Northern California, um, gold rush, um, the genocide of Northern California. But genocide doesn't mean there are no people. There's a genocide against Jews, but there are still Jews. You know, there's a whole country called Israel uh, that... <clears throat> Uh, so I think you have to see it that way, that these are um, these are nations, and they're nations without recognition by the United States. They call them nations, but they're, they're not, you know, they don't have the, um, the uh, they've won a lot, they have won a lot of uh, national powers, like the Native nations in the United States have won the right to actually have economic relations with other countries, important export that used to be banned. So there are you know, many things that have been won in these struggles over, well, you know, from the beginning, but especially since uh, the end of World War II. I think um, your book is so important too, because it reveals that not just that we've been lied to, because I think people generally know that, um, but that even how we think of U.S. history as moving from the, you know, the colonies east is a manifest destiny narrative. It's a settler colonial narrative. Um, and in California, precisely what you're saying, there's multiple colonialisms. And, and these erasures frame are co completely how people conceptualize time, conceptualize space, conceptualize history and where we fit in it. So I think that's the important work, you know, that, that your book is doing. Um, and 10 years later, I, I wonder if you recall when you were working on it, if there were things you weren't expecting to find or you were surprised when you were writing and researching? Absolutely, you know, in the initial writing of the book, um, <clears throat> I was actually asked to write it <coughs> by Beacon Press. I then, you know, did a proposal and everything, but it didn't occur to me, and uh, never occurred to me to write uh, this book. I was actually working on another book, uh, which I didn't, have never gotten back to, but which was unrelated completely. It was, you know, I'm from Oklahoma, and it was about, um, it was about Confederate, uh, Confederate, uh, um, you know, after the end of the Civil War, the uh, Confederate uh, gangs that were seen as, you know, as, uh, as kind of outlaws, uh, the outlaws like uh, and my growing up, I, I, I thought Belle Starr was, you know, this very brave woman. And, you know, she came from a slave-owning family. And so I, you know, I, I was... Um, I was writing that book and still want to get back to it. But um, so I was asked to do this and it sounded easy. You know, it, it sounded easy. Um, 
a 250 pages, you know, they wanted it less than 300 pages. It ended up being barely less, but a book that was accessible in a series, you know, it's a series uh, of Beacon Press. And the, the other books people should really look at too. There's, a, um, you know, the uh, uh, Black History, uh, Puerto Rican, um, uh, women's, uh, gay gay history of the united states it's a, a fantastic series and this was the i think this was the first in the series and um i i really thought it would be so simple and then i realized that it wasn't simple to put the whole history of um indigenous people uh, in what is now the United States in a way that is was is ex, uh, accessible and not, you know, this really academic. I could do that, uh, you know, for sure. But to do write a literary work, and I had written literary work, but it's a memoir. And uh, it... You know, I, uh, <laughs> I kept getting the contract renewed. Uh, my editor was extremely patient with me and believed in me. I tried to get out of it. I begged her, let me get out of this book. I can tell you someone else, you know, can write it. And, um, you know, she she was, she just was steadfast. You can do this, you know. <laughs> so um, it was what happens when I'm writing a book and I've written about 12 now and it um, when I'm not sitting down working on it it's I, I'm obsessed with it in my head I'm thinking and then I have ideas you know I, I, lights come on and finally I just um, got it you know that that the theme that had to be in the book the the mind to be drawn was military the u.s army the militarism and, and imperialism you know colonialism but especially looking at war so the colonial from the colonial period the first founding uh to the to 1890 the genocide almost of the Lakota people, the, the Wounded Knee uh, massacre that was kind of the last of the armed resistance of Native people on the continent. They continued to resist through, you know, legal means and all, and then of course the rise of militancy with the, with the um, decolonial movements in the rest of the world. Um, AIM came to be and other, um, other organizations that, that had a more militant and were hooked up and, and relating to the African National Congress and to SWAPO, the Southwest People's Organization, Namibia and other, you know, uh, anti-colonial revolutions going on but that uh to 1890 you know from 1607 to 1890 nothing but warfare and warfare continues you know there's not a day in the life of the united states that it has not been at war or since it was even founded in the colonies so that was something i already knew and I, I had another book I was writing, which was on that, you know, the on uh, U.S. militarism. So that was the that's the through thread in the book is war and the U.S. military. And we still see it today, you know, that it's um, uh, it's you know it's just the the most uh, militaristic. Uh, you know, maybe since, uh, I don't know, Sparta, you know, on a small scale in the Western world. Um, so that that's how I I finally found the through thread. And that's what you really have to have in a, work, a literary work. You have to have 
a thread that goes through it and then to build upon that. So at first it came out to what would have been in print, uh, five or 600 pages, I can't remember. And I had to whittle it down and it got better and better as I whittled it down. And, uh, and my editor was just brilliant. You know, I, every time I would send it, she would send it back with so many suggestions for changes and move this around and do this. And I said, oh, no, you know, and it was painful, but it was, you know, the in, in the end, it it's just a magical book, you know, it's just been... Um, picked up by so many people and it's digestible. It's, I don't know, John Kane, this uh, Haudenosaunee uh, Mohawk uh, friend, he calls it uh, one-stop shopping. <laughs> right, I, I think it's important too, cause you know, um, it must have been styled as a project, you know, in the publisher's mind from the, you know, the, the giant Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. And that certainly was, was the book that made me major in history as an undergrad, as a young native person. Um, but this book would have blown my mind, you know? I mean, it kind of brings tears to my eyes a little bit, just um, the kind of work and the kind of access to the, to the knowledge, to a different narrative. Um, and now I'm teaching women's movements in Latin America right now, and I'm teaching national liberation and U.S. counterinsurgency. And I was reviewing the book, and I was thinking how much even the Columbus narrative or Manifest Destiny and then beyond to U.S. imperialism, that those are all narratives that continue across, you know, across the U.S. border so that the history that you're talking about, of course, isn't just confined to the U.S. borders. And so for you, what do you see as the connection between this period of, of U.S. colonialism and the period and settler colonialism and um, into U.S. imperialism? Yeah, U.S. Um, uh, settler colonialism is, um, I really learned this myself as I was writing the book because I called it colonization, but there's a distinction between general colonization and this sub, let's say this sub uh, um, reality of settler colonialism because both were taking place, you can count South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, the United States and Canada as settler colonies. Also later for, these were all British and the British had first their, you know, their pat, their template was uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, inviting Anglo or uh, English, Wel Welsh and um, Scottish settlers to go for free land to simply warlike take away the land, seize it, and make the Irish, uh, you know, the Irish, Irish, Catholic Irish, uh, workers on the land that they had, they had, uh, it was the property for generations, generations, thousands of years. So that was a template for settler colonialism. You had it also in, um, in Iberia, um, the Castilians moving down and taking land from the Muslims and Jews and finally expelling them completely also. So you had this settler colonialism pattern and then the British extended it. Their colonies were settler colonies from the beginning. Um, uh, Newfoundland and, and the 13 colonies that were taken, those were densely populated with farming, agricultural people and fishing people, because it's on the ocean, um, who were interchanged, had their own trade routes, had their, you know, were um, actually traded further on, you know, traded uh, copper 
with Native people, even up in the Great Lakes area. And, but they were, you know, farmers are not warriors. <laughs> I grew up a farming family and you just want to get your crops in. You know, it's, um, it's a very peaceful <laughs> existence, but they uh, had to turn to war to defend themselves. And um, there was pretty much an ethnic cleansing. They pushed them, you know, to the peripheries and they would keep fighting from there. But they were, you know, the British were already an empire. You know, they were going to India and conquering that huge populated continent. So it was, um, it, it was then, you know, they, they established these as settler colonies. And that was to, um, you know, really to develop plantation cotton, you know, uh, using slaves uh, from who were transported across the ocean, kidnapped in Africa, West Africa, transported and enslaved for commercial agriculture. It was something new, you know, um, food crops were the, or what, you know, what was agriculture. This turned to cotton, fiber, indigo, uh, tobacco, non-food uh, commercial land, which also depletes the land over and over. And so what they would do is they completely wore out the land in Virginia, and South Carolina, the first colony. So they move on and take some more rich land, you know, in the South. So this was uh, how they got to the Mississippi and then um, made the big jump um, uh, from the Mississippi to take the war with Mexico and uh, annexed half of Mexico after a two year, you know, really, really genocidal war. Um, just um, the first of the, well, you know, the United States imperialism though was always uh, parallel to the settler colonialism. And what gets left out of the history books or is just barely mentioned and people don't remember it is the so-called Barbary Wars. And uh, this was the barbarians <laughs> of uh, North Africa. Does that sound familiar today? Um, the um, uh, Tripoli was the, the uh, they were city, they were city states and not nation states at the time, city states. And Tripoli was a big trading center. And the United States wanted to, now this is 1806 with Thomas Jefferson, this is 1806, not 1890, um, that they wanted to um, have access to all of the ports of the world the U.S., in other words, free, so-called free trade. So that they um, started building, rather than colonizing beyond the continent, I mean, they did Puerto Rico, of course, and they did uh, Hawaii eventually and Philippines, but mainly they set up um, uh, st uh, stations on islands and controlled islands around the world which they still do, many of them. And, and they um, have warships. So they wanted to get into the, they wanted access to the Mediterranean and the uh, Berber, the, the, the people of Tripoli, um, or the, the, the governor of Tripoli, they fought, fought them and won, there were two Barbary Wars. The second one, I mean, they won the first one, the Marines left. And the second one, uh, they were defeated, Tripoli were defeated. And uh, the United States was, you know, controlled the Mediterranean trade as of, you know, 1809. So people don't know that this, you know, this is, uh, the U.S. was 
that was right at the founding of the United States. They were off, and they had even gone before. In the uh, before, they became a nation state and uh, took an island in the Caribbean, the Bahamas. You know, so this is the Marine Corps. You just think of their hymn from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Right. What the hall of, halls of Montezuma is 1848, uh, yeah. 46 to 48, Mexico. And uh, before that, the Marine Corps, their first thing was the uh, Tripoli. But okay. very few people are curious about what, well, what is Tripoli in there? Right. And it makes so much sense because normally people think of Manifest Destiny, U.S. expansion, and then they like grew out and kept going to Hawaii, to Guam, to Philippines, right. to Spanish American War. Um, so you're saying that they're actually parallel projects that informed each other. And yeah. I'm getting starting to get lots of questions. And so they're going to ask us to wrap yeah. up here. But when you were talking about settler colonialism, you know, the country that comes to mind is Israel, right? The the modern right. movement and, and the current manufactured crisis of, right. you know, new genocidal actions, starving people, bombing people. And so I, and I know the indigenous peoples and, you know, we have a big um, movement of solidarity with Palestine as right. fellow indigenous people. And I'm wondering if you reflect on the, the history of this book and the relationship to what's happening right now in Israel. Yes, I include that. I include that in the book. Um, the, you know, uh, the late settler colonialisms uh, are Israel and South Africa, and of course, Northern Ireland and uh, South African apartheid uh, is, is very much the template that uh, Israel used to um, take the land and make little islands, you know, very vulnerable to um, uh, in uh, uh, for for the uh, Palestinians. And this, of course, started right after World War One. It began uh, the Balfour Declaration. That basically, you know, it was a British colony. And, uh, but it was only in 1848, I mean, 1948, that um, uh, that Israel was proclaimed a state and it was, uh, was really devastating, you know, has been ever since for Palestinians. And we see it right now, you know, just all out war. And I think the treatment of people, uh, especially in uh, Gaza, uh, the open air prison. Um, I think it just blew up. I mean, no one can support killing, uh, you know, women and children, the settlers. But, you know, basically, settlers are political people. They're also armed <laughs> in Israel. And um, settlers in the United States, settlers in Australia, New Zealand, they are, you know, they're the intruders. And um, so I think. We don't uh, in the United States is so is so deeply embedded in settler colonialism in the United States that it seems normal in Israel. You know, so it's very hard for them to grasp um, the Palestinian uh, you know situation and perception of it. Well, thank you, Roxanne. We have about five or six questions. Are you up for it? We have some time left too, I think. Um, the first question is, how do you think the George Floyd uprising and other moments of tension and resistance in the United States fit within an indigenous history of Turtle Island? Oh, that was a beautiful thing in, uh, in uh, 2020 during the early part of the depressing pandemic, that outburst of um, joy, really, uh, of uh, a freedom that was, of course, uh, joined as it moved across the United States 
Well, you know, right here in San Francisco, right away, the native people, you know, native people from many different places um, are here working, but in Northern California, and as they moved across, indigenous people became involved, especially in, well, in Albuquerque, you know, they took down not only the, the um, uh, these, uh, well, they, they were actually the ones that started the taking down the statues, you know, the statues of Columbus, the statues of, um, uh, that happened in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park, that the indigenous people and the Black Lives Matter uh, took down the Columbus and the Unipro Serra, the California uh, colonizer, and um, as they went across country, they uh, they did this. They took away their, you know, the Columbus statues, but also the local, um, uh, the 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 local colonizers, like and the Confederate monument, like Oñate in New Mexico, and then and then the you know the um, uh, the ones even uh, in. Um, in uh, uh, Chicago, and so it was such a, and and also Puerto Ricans um, and others. It became a joint by so many people in solidarity, um, and it was a moment when everyone understood it. It was you know that pandemic moment when people's heads were kind of clear of clutter because they weren't, you know, working and they weren't socializing very much. And it, it's just, you know, uh, it inspired everyone. So it took a lot to really crush it in the end. But um, I think that, I think it made a difference, you know, there's the shift in the culture since then. And um, also just the energy. I just know from having been myself radicalized into uh, action, you know, uh, movements, was um, just stepping into a, you know, um, a, uh, a protest against the Vietnam War. And I had never been in a demonstration before. I came from a very poor rural background and I, I, I went to college and all. I had, I actually learned a lot about Palestine, Palestine, because I had at University of Oklahoma, my boyfriend's best friend was a, an engineering, petroleum engineering student uh, whose family had been run out of Palestine. You know, the, the family lived in Jordan. Saeed Abalugad, and uh, he taught me all about Palestine in 1957, only 10 years after the Nakba. Maybe disappeared. <laughs> of course, there's uh, construction work happening right out the window. Oh, yeah. But thank you for that. I wanted to maybe combine the next two questions. Um, the first was, a question about if the book was written in partnership with or includes the voices of indigenous people. And the second is, I read the book, Now What? How do I help indigenous com communities here in the settler colony of the United States? What can I do? Uh, what, we're in the United States? They're saying, what can I do in the settler colony of the United States? Oh, oh the United, not a specific place. Um, did I work with uh, indigenous people? Well, I have, you know, all my, uh, you know, my entire career. I I did, you know, I'm a, I have a doctorate in history, but I did colonial uh, Western, colon, you know, colonial history, the colonization of the hemisphere, and um, ended up, you know, getting kind of recruited. In fact, I was recruited to do this UN work for that for that conference I talked about um, and just, you know, just ended up teaching a lot of courses, helping set up an ethnic studies uh, program that became a department at Cal State Hayward. 
Uh, so I, I kind of learned by doing. Um, in writing this book, uh, I have gone to conferences and know I have worked with so many indigenous peoples that yes, all of that was, you know, I felt a part of, of what went into the book. And I did have several friends, which I name in the uh, acknowledgements, quite a few friends who were kind enough to read the book and give me feedback. And uh, all along while I was writing it, I would, you know, consult with Susan Miller, a um, uh, Seminole historian uh, in Oklahoma, who's a very good friend, very, very excellent historian, Jennifer Dinatali and uh, Navajo and historian and um, just get their feedback when I was speaking about any particular tribe, you know, to, and, um, and of course, a lot of Lakota friends. And, you know, I, I think probably every um, nation, every indigenous nation in the country, I, I have some contact with and can consult with them. And what would you tell people once they read the book and say, what can I do to be in solidarity with indigenous people of the United States? I think really to teach from the book, to recommend it. And for um, teachers, you know, the Beacon Press, by the way, does, if you just go online to Beacon Press and the book, um, they have study guides for teachers. Uh, they have all kinds of materials um, to use for study groups of any kind, not just teachers, but groups that get together to study or to read. And um, uh, the book is used a lot in, uh, in, in the study groups. And, and I think the, the uh, materials that are free, uh, you know, Beacon Press has developed all these uh, uh, study items and uh, broken it down. There's also a young people's edition of the book that was done by uh, Debbie Reese, uh, Pueblo Indian, New Mexico, and Jean Mendoza uh, called An Indigenous People's History of the United States for Young People, also published by Beacon. So um, it's uh, uh, really meant to be a accessible to any reader, you know, whether educated, whether they have any kind of higher education or even just as long as they can read, you know, um, that it, I think it's accessible. That's, I work very hard to, to do that because I'm very sensitive to being one of the few people from, well, I'm, you know, me and my one brother, one brother, ever went to college from a rural Oklahoma town. And um, I think I'm the only one, even in my family, who ha has a doctorate degree. So I always have in mind what if I hadn't, by some accidents of fate, kind of gotten into being pushed into uh, continuing to PhD. I'd never even thought of doing that. Um, wasn't within my realm. Uh, and I think that's true of many, many people who don't have a college education. But this book can be read without, you know, with just if you can read, if you can, you're literate, you can read it. It's also in Spanish and French. <laughs> so. I, um, yeah, and I think, you know, there's indigenous movements in pretty much every town and state, and there's maybe land back movements and projects that are really important. I think that's a good way for people to get involved is in the land back yeah. movement, repatriating land back to tribes, either by donating uh, money or donating land or getting the word out about that. Um, yeah, yeah, wherever wherever you are in the country, there are different things going on. And there's almost all uh, medium and big cities in the country have American Indian centers or Native American centers by various names, indigenous centers, you know, where they have 
um, events and speakers and and dances, uh, you know, and um, uh, and so that you know, I think you can easily. You know, everyone is always welcome to these; they're open to the public, and um, there's there's also a lot of reading groups. I get a lot of. Um, uh, emails uh, contacting me about reading groups that they're reading my book. Uh, just just ordinary people in a neighborhood deciding to read it, and then they ask me if I might speak to them, and I always do. You know, I always will um, speak to them and encourage them, and they then you know spread it around. Um, and a lot of people do those reading groups even online. You know, you don't have to be in the same community necessarily to have a reading group. And you can jump into these reading groups. You know, you can find them online. Not just for my book, but for other, you know, other yeah, books. I think, yeah, I think people want to sometimes help Native communities. And a lot of times what Native communities need is for the larger white society to understand better what's happening. So I think getting the word out is a really important step. The last question yeah. also, oh, go ahead. Well, I would just say there are also in uh, junior colleges and colleges and even a lot of high schools, there are um, ethnic studies programs, Native American studies uh, all over the country now. And, um, you know, if you're in college, um, take those courses, you know, you may not want to major or whatever, but take a course and or adult education, just take a course in Native American studies. I like this, um, you know, shifting that whole narrative and our educational project. Um, someone, you know, circles us back to the question of Palestine and the last question yeah. and and says that, you know, all the recent events in Gaza and the average America is becoming more and more aware of how this nation was founded on blood, violence, and tears. So how do we move forward? How do we address this, the dissonance of the recent events um, internationally and in, in, in solidarity with Palestine as well? Yeah, it's really horrible what's going on right now as we speak. Um, the just the murder of uh, women, children, uh, men who are not, you know, even related to Hamas and uh, um, tanks going down the streets of of that, you know, that basically a refugee camp. Um, and uh, it's really, it's really heartbreaking uh, to see this, this kind of, you know, on a governmental, U.S. governmental level of just uh, lack of any kind of empathy or knowledge of the situation, as if, as if Palestinians are the settlers <laughs> instead of the indigenous people of the land you know i mean these people that that came as as refugees and then took um uh, took over with the help of of course the united states and great britain and that palestinian people are colonized people and they rise up you know i think of many other uh things like this where where the anger gets so great, like the, the Mau Mau in Kenya in the 1950s. It was the first anti-colonial uh, uprising that I was aware of. This is on TV, and TV had come about. And it made it seem like they were such murderers and killing, you know, killing the settlers and all. Um, but I, ha I just had this sense that, you know, well, what are those British people doing there anyway? You know, why are they even there? Uh, and these people don't want them there. <laughs> you know, so, um, so that I, I think, yes, 
the Jew, you know, the Jews have always lived in Israel, but it's only when Britain and the United States forced through the UN uh, recognizing a state of Israel that this became really a colonizing state and no longer a place where refugees were welcome. And uh, it was under British control and it should have been a Palestinian. And, and they said it's supposed to be divided, you know, Palestinian state never has been, they've never allowed that. So I think yeah. Palestinians are just fed up, you know, I mean, just the end of the rope, especially in Gaza. Yeah, I think, um some steps, some action steps is to become educated, to speak the truth. It's actually really hard to, to talk about it. As an educator, we often get targeted because we just speak the truth about um, about Zionism, you know, um, which is right. different, the Jewish people, but the Zionist project of occupation. So I think there's a lot of teach-ins. There's a teach-in at, at my university. Right. I saw this yeah. one in Houston at many community centers. So just getting involved, speaking out, telling the truth, being informed. I think this is, is you know, part of what we need to do. Just like your book is telling the truth, we need to keep telling the truth about other settler colonial projects, especially ones that our money is going to fund, yeah. And you know, there are demonstrations almost in every city. If you Google um, Palestine demonstrations, there's a list of, um, uh, everywhere and it may be near where you live um, and uh, they're coming over the weekend there are really a lot of them they're every day they're here in San Francisco and I'm sure in other places too so um, you learn a lot I know I did how I got involved in movements was at just listening at demonstrations you know listening to speakers because it's you learn what it would take reading many, many books, very curated to learn what you could learn in one demonstration or one rally uh, about these things. So I really recommend uh, doing that. You don't have to be invited. I used to think, oh, I, you know, I'd really like to be with those people. I thought I had to be invited to go get in a demonstration <laughs> or a rally. I didn't know you could just step in, you know, and I think it's important to show your support, your solidarity. Um, yeah. Or, you know, a beleaguered community that's over and over again under siege. And I yeah. see that our uh, friend Lori's coming in to <laughs> tell us time's mm. up. Thank you for such a beautiful conversation and a beautiful Yay. book. A lifetime of activism and scholarship, Roxanne. It's been and an thank, honor. But and thank bus boys. I love the store. I've been there, spoken in person many times, and eaten there. <laughs> I really love it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miley. Yeah, you're you. always welcome back. And <laughs> Professor Miley, please let us know if you're ever in the district. Okay. And for those of you at home, you can always visit us here in the DC metropolitan region, all across, all around where in Shirlington, Virginia, Highsville, Maryland, Columbia, Maryland, in addition to the DC locations. We have the 10th anniversary edition copies of uh, Professor Roxanne Dumbartiz's book in Indigenous People's History of the United States, available at all locations. And you can actually get one if you want, if you order food through like a third party platform like DoorDash, you can just add it onto your order and get it delivered straight to your door in case that's of interest to anyone. I did want to add that Nicole DeMello uh, mentioned that learning about the tribes whose ancestral lands you reside on and engaging with them is another way to show up for your um, local indigenous community <clears throat> where possible. And I just wanted to say, land back, yo. Uh, the Red Dogs just ended and I am like heartbroken, but like so happy to have seen that kind of representation and I hope to see more of that, so. Thank, thank you. you both so much. And thank you to everyone at home for tuning in. We hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bailey.